So as we continue in this little series about kingdom living, today we're going to be talking about forgiveness. Personally, I think this is one of the harder ones. But it's something we need to listen to. It's something we need to take away from and apply it to our lives because forgiveness is vital to salvation. So in our lesson today, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 18. And in chapter 18, there's some qualities that we're going to notice throughout this chapter that leads up to our passage. Our first one is this idea of verses 1 through 4. It's humility. Humility is vital. Responsibility is the next section. We get into individual care, uh, discipline, and fellowship that leads into it. But all the way throughout this, we have different headings in our Bibles for each one of them. But what I want you to think about is the reason behind it. Why does it talk about it? For an example, the whole chapter heading in my New American Standard is rank in the kingdom. And then starting in verse 7, it says stumbling blocks. In verse 12, uh, it's the 99 plus 1. Verse 15, uh, discipline and prayer. And then it brings it into our section in verse 31. My little cheater header says forgiveness. But it's about relationship. That's what this whole chapter is about. It's about how to have relationship in an imperfect body of Christ. Now, hear me carefully. When I say imperfect, I'm not saying Christ is. He is perfect. He is the one that has instituted this body that we're part of. But you see, what we got to remember is we are imperfect. We have struggles. We have shortcomings. We struggle with temptation and we fall into sin and feelings get hurt. I'm not saying we shouldn't. But when we don't let go of things, it just doesn't affect the body of Christ. It affects us individually. And we have to understand what that means. So throughout this first part of chapter 18, it's talking about different ways we can look at and work through this idea of relationship with one another. And then in verse... Uh, 21, it talks about this idea of Peter. Peter always voices up first. In verse 21, it says, And Peter came and said to him, Christ, that is, Lord, how often shall I shall my brothers sin against me and I forgive them? Up to seven times. This idea of seven times is an interesting concept because Peter isn't trying to like look at me sort of concept that we looked at last week in this idea of the tax uh, collector and the Pharisee praying. Uh, That's not what he's going about because in this context, he's going above and beyond. He's being gracious. You see, all throughout the ministry of Jesus, he always pointed to the Pharisees, the religious leaders, and say, be more than them. Listen to the law that they talk about, but go beyond where they are at. And that's what he's doing. You see, the rabbis had a teaching based on this idea that three times it would be forgiven, the fourth would not. And it comes out of Amos chapter 1, verse 3, where it talks about this concept. There's a limit to forgiveness. So when Peter says seven times, he's listening to what Jesus has been talking about. He understands this concept. The Pharisees, it was three and you're done. Three strikes and you're done. So he was taking it more than that. But then Jesus himself points out in verse 22 that it has to be more than that. It says, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seven, uh, 70 times seven. Now, this isn't the idea that there's a limit to forgiveness. Because personally, I'm thankful there isn't. Because I guarantee throughout my Christian life, I have had to ask for forgiveness more than 77 times, more than 770 times, more than a thousand times I've had to ask for forgiveness because of my shortcomings, 
because of my temptations, because of my sins. I'm glad there is no limit. And that's what Jesus is saying. It's not about tallies, about checks and balances. Well, you offended me, you lied to me, therefore mm, I might forgive you. That's not what is, he is talking about. No matter what it is, forgive them. Now, I've said this and I've heard people say this. Even if they don't ask, there's a benefit to forgiving people because it releases you. Because we hold on to things. And over time, this hurt feeling turns into anger, turns into wrath, and it tears you up from the inside out. We can all have experiences like that. And he goes on and he talks about this idea of reinforcing this point of that it's not about how many times you need to be forgiven. And when you reach that limit, there is no more grace, there is no more mercy, there is no more opportunity for you to receive and enter into the kingdom of heaven. He enters into this parable that he talks about. And there's quite a lot going on in this parable. So he picks up in verse 23. It says, For this reason the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wishes to settle accounts with his slaves. Verse 24, When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. So this idea of talents, talents can be summed up into, for each talent is 50 years worth of wages. One talent is 50 years. So one talent would equate to this idea of 18,250 days worth of labor. This one slave owes 10,000. It comes out to 182,500,000 days that he owes of labor. How in the world can he pay that back? Now, an interesting side note about this, when we're looking at this king and the slave, it's not this idea of being a house slave about uh, this different concepts that we would read about, about, about being a servant, someone that would wash the visitor's feet when they would come in. The context would dictate that these are people of authority and responsibility within the community, but they reported to him, the king. So this idea of Owen this much, how can he pay it back? But what's interesting is after he accounts this uh, 10,000 talents, he goes on and he says in verse 26, it says, so that the slave fell down on and on the ground, prostrated himself before him, saying, saying, have have mercy on me, I will repay you everything. So we get into this, how the king responds. And the Lord of the slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him his debt. Now, the times and the customs, he had the right to imprison him that it talked about earlier in this idea until the debt was paid. How could he repay that even in prison? He couldn't. But notice the king's response. He felt compassion and forgave him. He didn't demand repayment. It wasn't even what the slave asked for. The slave asked, be patient and I will repay it. But the king went beyond that. He went so far beyond what it was owed. So it goes on and he keeps going in this idea of what happens next. So in verse 29, so his, uh, excuse me, in verse 28, but that slave went out and found another fellow slave who owed him 100 denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him, say, saying, pay back what you owe me. 
So the debt in this case was a hundred denarii. A denarii was one day's work, uh, wage of labor. So he owed a hundred days. Is that feasible? Yes, it is. A hundred days, that would be a long hundred days of physical labor, but he could have paid it back. But it wasn't even an option. The slave that was forgiven a debt that was could never be repaid grabbed a hold physically, choked him, and demand to be repaid. Now, the slave's response is very similar to what was going on. He said uh, in verse 29, So his fellow slave fell on the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me. I will repay you. It is a direct copy of what the first slave said but how did he respond no you're a hundred days I want I want in full now he forgot completely how he had been forgiven so fellow slaves around him saw what was going on and reported to the king and we know what ended up happening in this parable. The first slave was thrown into prison because he was deemed a wicked slave because he forgot the debt that was forgiven and demanded repayment from someone else. So this idea of what's going on is we can jump all the way down to verse 35. Jesus brings it all back to the heart. And if you have heard me in class or from this pulpit, What God wants is our heart, mind, and reason behind everything. But it has to begin with our heart. So in verse 35, in the close of all of this, Jesus says, My my heavenly Father will also do the same to you if you you do not forgive his brother from the heart. You see, and I think that's an important part because at times we put a masquerade on. We will act accordingly dependent upon who we are around and exposed to or what is expected of us. But inside it is not there. We have words for this. Biblical terms, Old Testament, it's called lip service. We say what people want to hear, but we don't believe it. Today's word is a hypocrite. You say one thing, but you do another. You see, everything has to come from the heart in order to be truly forgiven. So it goes into this idea of it's not about lip service like we talked about. It's unwilling to forgive others. Now, uh, this is a rhetorical question, but think about this. Think of the times that you have been forgiven. Just think about that. We all have them. From early on in our relationship with our siblings and our mother and our father, into our adolescence, into our teenage years, into our adulthood. Paul talks so much about past He reminds his readers of what you used to be. And there's reasons for it. Not to feel guilty, but to remember you're a sinner who has been washed in the blood of Jesus and who has found forgiveness and throne room standing and kingdom living. We have to remember our past for those reasons, but also to show mercy to others, just like it's been shown to us. So Jesus has several different points throughout this parable. Uh, And I just want to take a minute and just look at these different concepts that we can get. We are all in debt to God. Romans chapter 3, 28, we have all sin and fall short of the glory of God. We all are sinners, but because of Christ, we have been redeemed. We have 
throne room standing. We have a kingdom that we begin living for today. But you see, it also talks about this idea that we cannot repay it. There is no way we could repay for the sins we have done. It is impossible to truly be able to forgive, be forgiven for our sins and have throne room standing. The cost is too high and it cannot be met. Thus, Christ came for that very reason. Also, it's this idea that Christ did pay for it. Totally, completely appeased God. That's what he came for. You know, in Bible class uh, with the youth, uh, we're going through this idea and keep coming back to this. The verse that everybody knows, it's one of the most uh, recited verses of the Bible. It's John 3.16. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And it goes on. And, but we're talking about it from, okay, yes, that's true, but what does that mean? What does that mean to me? How does that apply to me? And we start there and move forward because we have to understand what Christ has done for us. But it also talks about the idea of heavenly uh, kingdom living and this idea that we can start living now for the future. You know, in the business world, but also in the military, they have this concept of in the military, uh, whatever rank you are, you need to be able to perform at one rank above you, whatever their responsibility is, and two ranks underneath you. Same thing in the business world. We have funny sayings about it. Dress for the position you want, unless it's Batman, then just always dress as Batman. We always have these little memes about this, about moving up and moving beyond, living in the moment for what is to come. And that is our call as Christians. So how do we start doing this? We have to come to an understanding of what it means to have a forgiving heart. Because if we can't forgive one another here, how in the world are we going to be together up there? I don't know. We can't avoid one another. We can't hide. We can't not show up because that person's there. So there is this idea of God's forgiveness for us personally. We have to remember that. About me personally, like that first slave The debt that was forgiven could have never been repaid, but it was completely removed. We have to come to this understanding of what that is personally. You see that unmerciful slave, that first one, missed it. He was grateful that the king went beyond what he asked, and he was totally forgiven when it came to what was owed to him. Paul has some suggestions on how we can actually do this in this idea of developing a forgiving heart. Uh, In Ephesians, in verse, uh, excuse me, chapter 4, starting in verse 20. But you did not learn Christ this way. If indeed you have heard him and have uh, been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance to the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and Put on the new self, which is the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. He talks about this idea, yes, we know who you were. It's not a secret. You can't hide how you act. What you say, what you do, if it's good, bad, or otherwise, people know there is no such thing as a secret. The only secret that is truly kept is the lie that you tell yourself. 
somebody always knows, especially in this world today with the technology and everything else around us. You can't hide it. And you're not asked to hide it. But to learn from it, to remember it, to move forward from it. The second passage is in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 and 13. It says, So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, barren with one another, and forgiving each other, whoever has complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. We got to remember, we've been called out of this world. The world holds grudges. They will bring up everything under the sun and throw it at you. But in Christ, it shouldn't be that way. We should be able to let go. Jesus helps us to have a forgiving heart. There, there's an old song. It's by uh, Colin Ray. It's called uh, Little Rock. It was put out in 1997. It has this one line that sticks with me. Jesus may forgive, but a daddy never forgets. Jesus may forgive, but a daddy never forgets. You see, that was the problem in the parable we looked at. Verse 35 is the key. To forgive from the heart, you have to forget. So how would you define this idea of forgetting? Now, now let me explain this for just a minute. Now, we are to forgive without number. So if a person is stealing from me, I forgive them. I keep forgiving them. But that does not mean that I would not place safeguards, not just for myself, for the person who may be stealing against me in order to help them to overcome it. But I would protect myself, but I still forgive. But what does it mean to forget? The basic definition to forget is to uh, not remember something. But it's more than that. It's to not remember on purpose. You see, forgetting for a Christian is by purpose. You choose to forget. It's not by accident. If somebody hurts you, you don't just wake up one day and just, oh, forgot the whole situation. That's not what it's saying. You will remember it, but it's how you choose to deal with it and how you, de- how you decide to move on from it. So this idea of if we truly do not forget, are we forgiving? So our application for us in this uh, lesson about forgiving We need to have this idea that the heart of Jesus is the key for each one of us. The heart of Jesus. What is it? We talk about it. We study about it. We have in-depth discussions from Old Testament into New Testament about who Christ is, who the Messiah is, what he has done how he is alive and active within these four walls. But what about in your life, your day in, day out? How do you treat your coworkers? How do you treat the people underneath you? How do you talk to them? Well, they don't deserve. Is the normal response. Go back to the unmerciful servant. He was forgiven a debt that couldn't ever be repaid because of a merciful king. He didn't deserve forgiveness. By law, he had the right to throw him in jail until his debt was repaid, which meant until he died. 
That's what he deserved. But that's not what he got. What would be a good study to do, and I know we have done it before, what is grace, what is mercy, that whole concept, because we don't get what we deserve, and we forget that when it comes to other. That's the heart of Jesus. We need to get this idea about forgiveness and forgetting from the heart. Because like I said earlier, this idea, we can put the masquerade on. We can put the facade forward. We can act quite well. But it's not about how we act alone. It's about our heart. It has to be from our heart. The forgetting is not bringing it up again. To let it go. Do not throw it into their face when you get upset, when you get mad. We're getting back to that idea of tallies, checks and balances. And we do that sometimes. Well, I forgave you, or I overlooked, or I did, in an expectation for something in return. And I say this a lot, but it's true. Christianity is becoming a melting pot full of false concepts that sound right that we allow into the body of Christ and we treat one another according to the world. What's even worse is when we allow this worldly concept to dictate my relationship with God. And that's what this is about. We're to have the heart of Christ. We need to have the wisdom of God and the purpose of the Holy Spirit. That's what Christianity is about. It's about not throwing it back into their face, about continually, purposefully forgetting. The kingdom living must begin with mercy and forgiveness because that's all that's going to be in heaven are those that understand what that means. Because it is through Christ, it is through our relationship with Him. It's all based back to the John 3:16 of Christ coming to this earth at a time that the world was not ready to receive Him. They weren't in a good place. They weren't in a good relationship with Him, but He still came in order to redeem all. You see, kingdom living has to be more than just merely going through the motions. It's about living as if you're in heaven now, at this moment. And we're going to struggle with it. It's going to be hard. We're not going to be successful all of the time. But that's where the body comes into play. We pick one another up. We encourage one another. And we continue forward. Because that's kingdom living. Same reason, same purpose, same goal. So this week, that's what I would like you to think about. Is how you have been forgiven and how you should forgive others. You know, as we bring this to close, we may struggle with this concept of what it means to forgive. Truly forgive. Not saying the words, not going through the motions, but from the heart. Because that's where it has to begin, is from the heart. And that demands quite a bit. It demands recalling our past. To truly understand the significance, the impact of Christ's life on this earth, we have to remember how bad we were to truly forgive from the heart. Maybe someone is struggling with that. Maybe there's somebody here today that hasn't entered into the right relationship with God. And one of the parts is taking him on in baptism. Romans chapter 6 talks very detailed about what the baptism represents. That's where we come into contact in the watery grave with his blood for the forgiveness of our sins to enter into kingdom living. 
Whatever your needs are, would you please come as we stand and as we sing? Let's rise up and build the name.